On October 16, 1964, China conducted its first self-produced atomic bomb test, becoming the fifth nuclear-armed nation in the world alongside the United States, Soviet Union, and Great Britain. This achievement occurred in less than five years, and this video explores how China attained nuclear capabilities. At the time, the Chinese Communist Party, led by Mao Zedong, was concerned about potential American nuclear intervention during the Chinese Civil War, when the United States possessed atomic weapons. In 1949, Mao sought Soviet support for China's security. Initially, the Soviets were hesitant to provide a nuclear umbrella for China, but Mao pushed for a more explicit commitment, leading to the inclusion of, with all means at its disposal, in a treaty, strengthening the assurance of Soviet assistance in case of invasion. Formal agreements between China and the Soviet Union did not explicitly mention nuclear weapons, leaving interpretation to the involved parties. During the Korean War, when American forces near the Yalu River, the border between North Korea and China, concerns arose that the United States might invade Communist China and use nuclear weapons. Despite these fears, Chinese leaders decided to intervene, relying on their numerical advantage and the belief that the United States wouldn't risk an all-out nuclear conflict with the Soviet Union. This gamble paid off as the U.S. didn't employ nuclear weapons despite prior threats. Post-Korean War, the U.S. continued pressuring China on nuclear matters, leading to what the Chinese leadership termed nuclear blackmail. Key figures under President Eisenhower characterized the Chinese Communist regime as hostile. The commander of the Strategic Air Command made alarming statements in 1954 about dropping bombs in certain areas in China, Manchuria, and southeastern Russia. These remarks understandably alarmed the Chinese leadership. During the first Taiwan Strait crisis in 1954, U.S. military leaders considered using nuclear weapons against China, but President Eisenhower ultimately chose not to. Even without these events, Mao Zedong and the Communist Party were likely to pursue atomic weapon development, but the crises accelerated their efforts. Initially, Mao sought Soviet assistance, given the strong Soviet-China relationship involving trade, loans, and military equipment supply. In 1949, a Chinese Communist delegation visited Stalin and inquired about Soviet nuclear facilities, but Stalin did not share atomic technology during his lifetime, offering only the protection of their nuclear umbrella. After Stalin's death, Nikita Khrushchev became the leader of the Soviet Union and sought Chinese support to strengthen his domestic influence and eliminate Stalinism. In 1954, he emphasized the importance of helping China develop its industry to solidify their friendship. During his visit to China in October 1954, Mao asked Khrushchev for assistance in China's nuclear weapons program. Initially surprised, Khrushchev tried to dissuade China, highlighting the existing Soviet nuclear umbrella and urging them to focus on economic development. Despite Khrushchev's efforts, China persisted, leading to a cooperation agreement. Under this treaty, the Soviets agreed to provide China with a nuclear power plant and a cyclotron for peaceful atomic energy use. Soviet nuclear experts conducted lectures and screenings for 1,400 Chinese scientists, including Zhou Enlai, facilitating the knowledge transfer. As part of the cooperation, Soviet scientists were sent to China to assess uranium reserves in Xinjiang, with surplus uranium intended for export to the Soviet Union. Khrushchev expanded the cooperation by sending more Chinese students to the Soviet Union and aiding in the construction of nuclear research facilities in China. During this period, Sino-Soviet relations were strong, but Mao and his colleagues saw it as a temporary alliance, aiming to maximize knowledge transfer while available. To support its nuclear program, China increased science research funding from $15 million in 1955 to $100 million in 1956, with a significant portion going to the Chinese Academy of Sciences for purchasing Western science literature. Talented scientists, including expatriates like Dr. Chen Shasen, who faced persecution in the United States due to accusations of communist sympathies, played crucial roles in China's nuclear program attracting some of the nation's best scientific minds to contribute to the effort. Several notable expatriate scientists, such as Chen Weitong, Chen Sanchang, and Peng Hongwu, made significant contributions to China's scientific development. Peng Hongwu, a quantum physicist with two doctorates in 10 years, and the first Chinese student under Nobel Prize winner Max Born, stood out. Soviet assistance up to 1957 primarily focused on reactor design for peaceful atomic energy, reflecting their genuine intent. 
The Chinese had already acquired knowledge of accelerators and nuclear reactors from Western literature. However, building a nuclear weapon required different techniques and a substantial infrastructure which the Soviets were reluctant to share. In 1956, anti-communist protests erupted in Hungary and Poland, prompting Soviet repression. Weakened by these events, the Soviets sought support from their primary ally, China. In 1957, against military and scientific advice, Khrushchev decided to transfer atomic bomb technology to China, marking a pivotal moment in the collaboration between the two nations. That year, China and the Soviet Union signed an agreement that included the transfer of significant nuclear technology and equipment, marking a pivotal moment for China's nuclear weapons program. This agreement covered a teaching model atomic bomb, designs, documentation, casings, uranium and plutonium processing technology, and testing guidance. However, while Soviet officials claimed full transparency, the reality was more nuanced. The Soviets shared some information, but imposed limits on their scientists and didn't provide comprehensive documentation. The Chinese were dissatisfied with the information they received, particularly in nuclear weapons design. Some Soviet lectures offered limited information, and inaccuracies in the 1958 Soviet lecture led to confusion among Chinese scientists. Despite these challenges, the collaboration played a vital role in advancing China's nuclear weapons program. Nonetheless, the scale of technology transferred from the Soviets to China was substantial, covering uranium prospecting, mining, and the provision of advanced missiles, including intercontinental ballistic missiles. This military technology cooperation occurred from 1957 to 1960, served as the foundation for China's nuclear weapons program. The Sino-Soviet split, a complex historical topic, significantly influenced this nuclear cooperation. Tensions between the two communist powers began in 1956 when Khrushchev criticized Stalin's cult of personality. Mao perceived this as an indirect attack on him. In 1957, Mao's remarks at the Moscow Conference of World Communists and Workers' Parties indicated a willingness to risk nuclear war for a global socialist revolution, alarming the Soviet leadership and raising concerns. The October 1957 agreement included a key provision for a teaching bomb prototype to be delivered to China. However, just a month later, Mao's remarks raised concerns among Soviet leaders, prompting them to renege on this deliverable and postpone its transfer. Throughout 1958, the transfer of the teaching bomb prototype was repeatedly delayed due to Moscow's security concerns and modifications demands. Eventually, the Soviets indefinitely postponed the transfer, citing concerns about straining relations with the West. The second Taiwan Strait crisis in 1958, where Mao initiated shelling on islands near the Chinese mainland, heightened the risk of a nuclear conflict. Stalin believed Mao was intentionally trying to provoke a global war, diverting the focus away from China and Taiwan. Realizing the implications, Khrushchev terminated military cooperation with China in June 1959. Soviet military advisors were recalled, with most leaving within a month, and the last advisor departed in 1960. The aftermath of the Sino-Soviet split saw a significant fallout for China's nuclear program. Despite promises, 40% of the equipment and raw materials pledged by the Soviets never arrived. Out of 30 nuclear industry projects, only a minority were completed, with nine having to be shut down, necessitating a fresh start for China in many cases. The withdrawal of Soviet advisors was somewhat anticipated, as some Chinese leaders believe the Soviets aimed to maintain a technological gap between the two countries, rendering their technical aid unreliable. In response, the Chinese initiated the 596 project in 1960, determined to achieve a breakthrough within three years, mastering technical knowledge within five years, and amassing a stockpile of nuclear weapons within eight years. Amidst economic and social pressures associated with the Great Leap Forward, China decided to abandon the dual-track approach, postpone the plutonium bomb method, and focus solely on the uranium design. The last Soviet advisors left the Lanzhou facility in 1960, leaving Chinese technicians with the responsibility of sourcing tens of thousands of raw materials and supplies for the uranium production line across China in a challenging effort to salvage their nuclear program. Chinese scientists managed to find substitutes for many Soviet components, including a special lubricant for gaseous diffusion pumps that the Soviet advisors had taken with them. 
By mid-1963, scientists at the Lanzhou facility had successfully isolated uranium, and by January 1964, the scientists had achieved 90% enrichment, earning praise from Mao Zedong. With enriched uranium obtained, the next step was designing and assembling the bomb itself. The Chinese adopted the Hiroshima design, using uranium instead of plutonium. Synchronizing high explosives was crucial in their bomb design to avoid premature neutron bursts. Unlike the British, who had scientists at Los Alamos, the Chinese lacked the advantage, but had the theoretical knowledge and confidence. After the Soviets departed in 1960, the Chinese completed their theoretical work. The Soviets helped by improperly shedding critical papers, which the Chinese meticulously reconstructed, aiding their nuclear program. The team utilized hand calculators to master complex equations and simulations, and by the end of 1962, they understood implosion theory, finalizing their design in 1963. The uranium for the bomb arrived in late 1963 at a manufacturing plant in Gansu province, where skilled craftsmen machined it into a highly enriched uranium ball and assembled the bomb. The successful nuclear test conducted by China surprised both the Americans and Soviets. The U.S. government was aware of China's nuclear program since 1959 and contemplated intervention due to concerns about communism spreading in Southeast Asia. President Kennedy had discussed the possibility of military action with Khrushchev in 1961 but didn't pursue it. Some in the Kennedy administration downplay the potential military impact of a nuclear-armed China. China's decision to use an implosion-style bomb with the uranium instead of plutonium caused confusion for American intelligence. Despite observing Chinese preparations for a bomb test, the Americans incorrectly believed that China's small gaseous diffusion plant in Nanjing was inadequate for producing a genuine nuclear weapon. It was only on the eve of the actual test that they realized their mistake. China's indigenous nuclear bomb program was a massive endeavor, involving hundreds of thousands of individuals across 20 provinces in over 900 factories, research institutes, and schools. This effort came at a considerable cost for an undeveloped nation, with estimates suggesting a total expenditure of around $4 billion over the 10-year program. Many of these costs were incurred during economically challenging periods, such as the Great Leap Forward and the early 1960s, leading to cuts in other government projects. Deng Xiaoping mentioned in 1966 that Soviet assistance was crucial but the abrupt termination of that aid served as a motivation for the Chinese to complete the project.